All right, everyone. Welcome back to the Rich Mind Podcast. And today, super excited about the conversation getting ready to have with Daryl Dittmer. He's uh, coming to us from uh, North Georgia, in the mountains of North Georgia. We were just having a conversation before we hit record here. I didn't even really guess put that Georgia really had mountains, or you know what I mean? So it's at the very end of the Appalachian Mountains, which makes sense, I guess, right? When you're thinking about North Carolina, South Carolina, and even up into the Virginias as well. But he's coming to us from North Georgia, which is super cool. But Daryl is a successful husband successful father and entrepreneur. He's a full-time life student and has been sober for decades. And I'm sure we'll get into that part of his story as well. He's also an author and he's actually an author of two books. He has one that's going to actually be released in the next few weeks, depending on when this episode gets launched. It might be live uh, when you're actually hearing this in real time, but it's going to be coming up real soon. But the first book that he's also an author of is When I Stop Fighting. And actually the second book is When You Stop Fighting, correct? Isn't that right, Daryl? Correct. Yes. Yes. Fantastic. So I got that backwards. So the first one is when I stop fighting and the second one will be when you stop fighting. And the uh, subtitle for the, when I stop fighting is the unexpected joy of getting the unexpected joy of getting my head out of my ass. And just that alone is just intriguing. I'm just curious where that came from. And we'll, I'm sure we'll get into that during the conversation. He's also a fellow podcaster and his podcast is also by the same name when I stop fighting. And we'll talk about that as well. Daryl loves to share his stories with the goal of inspiring anyone who's looking for positive change. And as I mentioned, he's coming to us from the North Georgia mountains. So like I said, we're going to have a fun conversation. He's a, a, a former Midwesterner, which as you know, anybody listening to me on the podcast, I'm still here in Indiana. I'm still a Midwesterner, but obviously we have connections uh, from that time frame as well. But anyways, Daryl, welcome to the show. It's going to be a fun conversation. Thanks, Randy. Appreciate it. I, I appreciate you having me on today. Thank you. Yeah, it'll be a lot of fun. So I went through a few of the bullet point lists, a little bit about yourself, but I would love to for have you unpack that as far and as wide as you would like, right? Tell us a little bit more about yourself, uh, share your story, and yeah, let's let everybody get to know you a little bit better. Sure, definitely. Uh, to be fair, I didn't know North Georgia had mountains either. I didn't know what was going on um, until we started exploring. So so maybe we could touch on that, but that was that was uh, an interesting part of my journey, and and one of the things that I love about life is is you never really know where it's going, and and to the extent that I think I do, I find out that I don't, and, and you know at some point, probably by the time this ride ends, I'll, I'll figure out that I just don't know, and that'll be completely okay. <laughs> but um, Anyway, so so my story, I started in the Midwest, as you mentioned, in, in Michigan. And, uh, you know, it was, it was, I was in the midst of um, the Protestant work ethic. That was kind of what we grew up around and believing. And that's, you know, some of the things we were, we were handed as far as our belief system, you know, at those, at that young age, I was, my dad was a Navy veteran. He was a mechanic for General Motors. And it seemed like everybody's dad at that time was, you know, either worked for General, General Motors Ford or Chrysler and, you know, or a supplier, right? Like that was just kind of how it went. Uh, and especially in Michigan, you know, in Detroit, that's, it's just, you know, it's all about the, uh, the Motor City. So, so that was how I grew up. My dad was a pretty strict guy, a pretty tough guy. Um, and my mom was actually pretty strict and pretty tough too. And, and, and when I say that, I, I don't, there, there's, you know, my upbringing was, it was what it was. It was completely fine. It was completely cool. I look back now and, uh, and I thank God that, it, you know, my parents were who they were and they cared about us and, and, you know, no parent does anything perfectly and, and no parent you know, comes with a parenting doesn't come with a set of instructions. So, so it, it takes, you know, it takes some time and it took me some time to understand that, you know, you, you kind of get what you get when it comes to parents. And, and I couldn't have asked for, for better parents as I look back now. And that doesn't mean everything was perfect, if that makes sense. It so, does. and I, and I think that's a, you know, that was a cool thing for me to sort of get to and understand. And, um, you know, to, to illustrate my dad's, my dad's, you know, sort of tough side, um, 
just kind of get a feel for him and and where I came from because I think I there's a part of me that emulates him to a certain extent and then obviously parts that I emulate my mom but but we were camping one time and we had this little pop-up camper with the the wings that fold out you know it was uh it was that we used to do a lot of camping and 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 that was just a great way because we didn't have a lot of money and it was a fun way to you know just go out and do stuff and and uh and when i say we didn't have a lot of money it wasn't like we were poor we just you know it was it was it, we had what we had and 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 you know having i think back and and i think of you know sometimes we had to have powdered milk and and i washed i watched my mom wash you know, Ziploc bags or sandwich bags. They weren't even Ziplocs. They were like sandwich bags, you know, like that sort of thing. So, so, you know, it was, we weren't like, we weren't like rolling in the dough or anything like that. So, but my dad, we were camping and, and, you know, it was, it was early in the morning. Um, and probably I'm going to say, you know, the sun was just coming up. So we were still sleeping and we had a, a black lab uh, who would stay outside and stay, you know, kind of sleep underneath our little camper. And I heard something, I heard something out of my, uh, you know, just like rustling or leaves or sticks or something. And I, I kind of peek out and I look and I see a couple people that are just kind of messing around, around our stuff. And I'm like, well, what are they doing around our stuff? And I, and I didn't, you know, I didn't say anything. I didn't move. Nobody else that I knew was, was awake. And, and then I, I heard my dad stir a little bit and then he started to get out of his, his uh, bed and he looked over at me and he went like this. And I was like, okay, no, no problem. Go take care of it. And, uh, and I was young. I don't know how old I was, nine, 10, maybe something like that. But, but anyway, he goes under the, the mattress of his, his, uh, you know, the, the little mattress that he was sleeping on and, and he grabs a machete and, and he flings the door open of the camper. And I'm sure he scared the, you know, what out of these people. And right then the dog started barking. The dog's name was Duchess and just started, you know, going crazy. And my dad walked out there and he said, can I help you guys with something, you know, with machete in hand. And so that was just, that was him, you know, and, and he was tough as nails. He would do anything for his family, anything to protect his family. You know, my mom worried, you know, what if they had a gun, this and that. And my dad said, well, his, the gun and his arm would have been on the ground. Um, so don't <laughs> worry about it. So that's kind of my dad. You know, that's that's how I how I grew up. And that's the dad I had. Pretty tough dude. Um, and not a guy to trifle with, you know. And, and we learned that and we didn't. So... So around, you know, age 13, I, 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 I got, I drank for the first time. And, you know, I think that's a pretty typical story uh, that that's, you know, around the time people start experimenting or whatever. And, and so I did that and, and uh, you know, the oddest thing happened. I loved it. And, uh, and that was, uh, that was part of how it happened for me and how that, you know, that started for me. And, and I wanted to do it again. And I, I got into a little trouble the first time I drank. I just got into a trouble with this, this older high school kid. And I was messing with him. What messing with him. I mean, he was probably that far from beating the crap out of me. And, and, uh, but that's kind of what it, what it, uh, what happened. And, and that's, that's what happened for years after that. Uh, the years that I, that I chose to, to have that lifestyle. And, and without going into too much detail, you know, because I think there's there's everybody has their stories that, you know, that become sober, or recover or that sort of thing. And and the stories are interesting. And, and but but the 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 key to this life and the key to being sober and the key to recovering is how much I change you know, how much I changed from being that person who needed to do that for whatever reason to being the person that didn't need to do that to feel like I had a complete contented life. Um, so, so it escalated over time. I got into a bunch of different drugs and, and, you know, did, uh, a, a lot of different things and, and opioids and, and, uh, hallucinogens and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And, and it got to the point where that was all I wanted to do. That was all I wanted to do. I had to work because, 
because that's what we did. I, I worked on farms and, and, you know, that was, that was just part of it. And, and so I, I kept up with that, you know, to the best of my ability to work and, and all those sorts of things. And I still went to school. I got into a pretty fair amount of trouble in school and, and that was just part of it too. But, but it got to the point where inside me, you know, all the things that I was taught as a kid with that, you know, Protestant upbringing and fairly strict parents and manners and yes, ma'am, and yes, sir, and no, ma'am, and no, sir, and that sort of thing. All that stuff kind of got washed out and and went to the wayside. And I was living this life that I knew you know, I was lying, I was cheating, I was stealing, I was doing things that were against my grain. They were against my upbringing. And they were things that I normally wouldn't have done, but I was supporting this uh, dysfunctional Daryl. And, and so, so I was in, you know, a, a, a fair amount of turmoil and, and it came down to an intervention um, where my parents kind of, you know, took the reins on that. And they, one day they, they said, we need to talk. And I was like, oh boy, um, that was never, that was never good news. Um, and they said, we want you to go talk to this drug counselor. And, and if you don't want to talk to this drug counselor, and I was 18 at the time, if you don't want to talk to this drug counselor, just, you know, get out of our lives for the most part, you know, it was kind of what it was. And, uh, so and that was difficult. And and I think the, the appointment was, you know, a week hence or something. So I was, I was, I was shaking in my boots the whole time. And, you know, should I, shouldn't I, what am I going to do? And, and I decided to go and, and I decided to go talk to this drug counselor and more to just, you know, like, like just go through the motion. I was going to lie to him. I was going to do my stuff and, and try to get out of it. Like I did with everything else um, you know, just lie and, and see if it works. And, and I did that. Uh, I I walked in and I had that plan and he looked at me and he said, you can't lie to me. You don't even try to BS me. I don't want to hear it. I'll know when you do, and I'll call you on it and, you know, I'll boot you out and that'll be the deal. So, so I was intimidated. Like I said, I was 18 years old. I didn't have any self-confidence. I couldn't look people in the eye. I just, I was crumbling as a person. And, and so I, I was as honest as I could be at that point in my life, whatever that looked like. I don't remember, but I know I was as honest as I could be at that point in my life. And he said, at the end, I said, well, what do you think doc? And he said, well, uh, you need to go into a inpatient drug and alcohol treatment program. So, so that's where I ended up and and I was 19. It was probably, I was right at the end of my 18th year. When I talked to him, I just turned 19 and January 3rd of 1985 was when I went into treatment. And that's, that's the first chunk of my life. Um, so so I'll uh, I'll drop it there and we can we can go where, wherever you'd like to go. So the question that's coming to my mind, you said you were 18 or you were turning 19 at that point. Were you still in school or were you out of school transitioning to that college age at that point? I was uh out of school transitioning to the college age with no no plans to go to college. So I mentioned to you before we hit record, I was at that same at that point in my life, I had no idea what I was going to do, which is once again, the reason why your story resonated so much with me is because I can, I can vividly remember getting to that point of senior year, late junior, senior year going, what in the world am I going to do now? I had no idea, which it sounds like obviously you were, you were, had some addictions, which was obviously not doing well for you as far as the way you were probably acting and being and all those kinds of things. But being from the Midwest, also, we're just running around doing stuff we shouldn't have been doing all the time. Uh, I mentioned to you when we uh, before we hit record here too. I actually had a negative experience the first time I uh, consumed alcohol, which I think kept me from going down the path of consuming a lot of it. But to say that I wasn't doing the stupid stuff along with my other friends, that would not be accurate. Um, it's just amazing how you think about today, where where you're, we're basically being you know where everybody is basically at any given time. And so back then it's like, you could just literally go be somewhere, somebody's house or even out in 
fields or wherever and just doing things you necessarily probably shouldn't have been doing, which was was pretty difficult uh, to have, a, like I said, that wake up call even for myself. So the question that I have is when you had that come to Jesus moment, basically, right, from that counselor, tell me where you were at as far as why did that moment get you to move forward? Was it because he intimidated you at that moment? Or what was the pivot point for you to take that? I mean, because obviously it was a, a 360 from where you were in that moment in your life to where you obviously have gotten yourself to are now. And if you hadn't made that decision back then, who knows where you would have ended up. So just curious as far as why that moment and why that person at that at that time got you to actually see yourself where you were uh, to make that change. Yeah, you know, it was... There was there was sort of a, a logical progression from my uh, meeting with him to, okay, let's schedule you going into treatment. And I wasn't convinced. My, my only um, experience with any sort of drug treatment or whatever was one of, one of our friends. And, you know, we had this little posse. One of our friends was put into treatment. Um, and he was, I don't know, he was probably in for 30 or 60 days. And 10 minutes after he was out, he's sitting at this dude's house with us and we're doing the same things. And he came in and he's like, you know what? Oh, thank God I'm out of there. And, you know, and we're doing all our drugs and whatever and drinking. And so, so that was the only reference I had about treatment. So, so I agreed to go into treatment. Um, but the pivot point for me was, uh, New Year's Eve before January uh, 3rd of 85, so December 31 of 84, um, I was at a New Year's Eve party, and I don't even remember where it was. I don't remember um, much about it. The only thing that I remember is, and, and this was very vivid in terms of the feeling, I was around a lot of people um, you know, at least a hundred, maybe 150. I don't know how many people there were, but, but I'd never felt more lonely. I'd never felt more scared. Um, I was, I was petrified of going into this drug treatment program and, and, you know, it, it crossed my mind that like, maybe I don't want to be on this planet anymore. So, so that was the point I got to. And that was the point where for me, that was, that was it. And, and not that I made a decision at that time, but I've never forgotten being at that point in here. And, and so it, it, I think there was a spark of, of willingness maybe that just sort of uh, shown itself. And, and that was enough to, when I got into treatment and, and as I went through treatment, um, I paid attention to the best of my ability. So one thing I picked up from listening to your story and learning more about you is that mentors have been huge in your life as far as giving back to you some guidance, some wisdom to kind of keep you going down that path. One thing that for myself personally, that I wish I would have had more of is mentors. One thing that, so with my family, with my parents and my dad, a lot of the things that I've discovered for myself have been self-taught. I've not, I didn't have influences in my life to teach me even basic personal development things, even financial businesses, just basic things that, that we might take for granted today. But mentors have been a huge influence in your life. So I'm just imagining taking that huge leap, going into some treatment and then being, you know, having the discovery of these mentors and how much that has impacted your life. I'm just curious, talk about that a little bit as far as how much of an impact that really was for you. Sure. Uh indispensable. Um, and that's, that's really the only thing I can say, but you know, I was, um, I went into treatment and, and two things that I got out of treatment. One, I got a 12 step program that I could, could, I had a roadmap to, to living it. You know, there's only one of those steps that has to do with getting rid of the, the drugs and the alcohol. The other 11 have to do with becoming a better me. And, and so I think that's a misconception. A lot of people have, you know, the, if I'm going to be on the launch pad, I can't have all this garbage on the launch pad with me. You know, I need to, I need to improve me, you know, not improve the world, not improve anything, just improve me. So, 
So I got the 12 steps and I got hope. Those are the two things I got. I hope that I could have a better life, hope that I could have some self-confidence, hope that I could look people in the eye, hope that, you know, that I could have just a, a conversation with somebody without feeling like I'm curling up inside. You know, that's, that's how I was at that time. And, and so probably, uh, well, I got out of treatment and I thought, you know, I am going to, uh, a lot of this stuff is in my book and, and, uh, you know, I, I went to college and because I, because I decided that I wanted to do something different with my life. Nobody in my, in my family had graduated from college before. And I thought, you know, that's something I want to do. And, and so I ended up going to college and I, I, uh, I tried out for the basketball teams. I was, I guess, decent in high school. And, and so I tried out for the basketball team and I made the basketball team and, and all this stuff was happening that I wasn't, um, familiar with you know, like studying and, and trying and, you know, all that sort of stuff. So <laughs> the things that kind of make the world go around. <laughs> and, and I was about eight months out of treatment at that time. And I met one of my mentors at a local 12 step, uh, meeting and his name was Bud. And he was, he was absolutely the, the person that, that at that time in my life was the perfect person that I needed. And, and, and I was looking for someone who had their own stuff together, you know, and their own sort of, I, I looked in his eyes and I saw someone who just looked like they were at peace. They looked like they were content. All the things he said were things that resonated with me. And I, and I wanted that. I wanted to feel like that. And so so I asked him to, you know, help me out and 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 he did throughout my years in college and and he actually is he 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 taught me many 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 things but but one of the things that he said to me um you know cuz I grew up with if you're struggling go get a bigger hammer right like if you're if you're if you're not uh bleeding out you're not hurt you know, no pain, no gain, all that sort of stuff. Right. So that's just yeah. how it was. And sure. And that was fine. I, you know, that was how I lived my life, but I was, I was wrestling with everything and, and I would wrestle my way through problems and, and, you know, it just, it's not the, um, it's not the formula for, for winning long-term, you know, you can, you can jam some stuff through every once in a while and, and force things and that sort of stuff, but it's not the formula for winning. So, so as I was wrestling with some issue or problem, I don't remember exactly what it was, but, but, uh, you know, I was talking to Bud about it and, and Bud said to me, he said, Daryl, when you stop fighting, the fighting stops. And I have remembered that almost every day in my life. And <clears throat> excuse me, I am a, I'm a motivated dude. I like to, I like to do new things. I like to accomplish things. I like to get good at things. Um, but that turned my entire perception of life on its head because, and it wasn't that it, that it, you know, nothing integrates, integrates that day. You know, when somebody says, I'm like, oh, okay, I got it now. So I've been doing that my whole life. I've been doing the, you know, when I stop fighting, the fighting stops thing my whole life. And obviously that's why I titled my book, When I Stop Fighting, um, my first book, When I Stop Fighting. And, and, you know, that was one of the things that Bud imparted to me that was an absolute life changer. So once again, that wisdom, getting that from mentors is so critical. So whether you're seeking real life mentors, folks listening to us today, or even virtual mentors. There's so much, so many different ways to get wisdom from folks, which is why we're trying to show up here today and share some of our stories uh, in the hopes that it'll help resonate with you, right? Where you can potentially achieve greater things. Cause that's kind of at the end of the day, that's, that's where I'm at in my life. I want to try to give back as much as I possibly can based on what I've learned, but then meeting people just like you, Daryl, that have been, had different experiences, similar, but different that can share stories, right? And I think that that's how we can all learn how to navigate this thing that we call life the best that we possibly can. Because like you said, with parenting, there is no 
there's no manual. You, you don't know what you're doing, how you're doing it. You're just trying to figure it out as you go. And it's, I think it's the same thing with life as well. So you've gotten through, through college, it sounds like, and uh, take me into then as you start to get into your professional career. And it sounds like you've had a few pivots along the road there as well. Uh, tell me a little bit more about that part of the story as well. Sure. Um, so I graduated college with a criminal justice degree. And the reason I did that is my brother was a cop. Uh, my grandfather on one side was a cop. My grandfather on the other side was a firefighter. Um, nobody was, you know, a business person or anything like that. I didn't know the difference between wholesale and retail when I got out of college. Um, so, so that was just me. I was a very blue collar kid and I grew up in a very blue collar environment and, and I was scared to death of people say business marketing, you know, finance. I'm like, what are you talking about? I, you know, I have no idea what that stuff is. So, so that's what I got my degree in. And I thought, you know, do I want to do I want to keep pursuing school? And then the answer to that was took about a, a, a millionth of a second. And it was <laughs> no, I absolutely don't. I'm done. I want to go out and, and see what I can do. So so the first thing that I did was I went back as I had I had, had some experience doing framing work uh, as a carpenter. And, and I got out of college and I went back with this buddy of mine, Andy, um, and you know, he owned the framing company. The, the first one I went to, he didn't own, but then he started his own. I went with him and, and I did framing and, and, you know, I, I did a few months of that and somebody came along and they said, well, do you want to get involved in sales? And I was like, no, I don't want to get involved in sales. I'm good, man. Thank you for asking. And, uh, and he said, well, people are making, you know, 10, 20, $30,000 a month. I was like, come on but it was a network marketing thing. It was, and I had no idea. And so it was this network marketing thing, which, you know, is neither here nor there, but I had no idea. And it was, it had to do with water filters. So he, he gave me a tape, you know, VHS, right? Yeah, anybody knows what those are. Nobody, right? <laughs> yeah. Nobody knows what that is anymore, but it was a VHS tape, you know, and you pop it in your DVR and your, or I think it was no VCR. VCR. VCR there you go. And uh, so anyway, I popped that in and people are telling these stories about how much money they're making. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to try it. So I tried it part time and, and I made a little money and did a couple of things. And and uh, and then I said to Andy, I said, you know, I can't do Carpenter anymore, man. I'm sorry. And and so I got involved in that. And that lasted, I don't know, a year, maybe something like that. And then one of the guys that I met doing that said, hey, you want to get involved in um, with this, this company that's, you know, a well-known, reputable, older company as a salesperson. And I said, sure, why not? I'll try that. And so I tried that and that didn't really go well. You know, I, I, I was not, uh, I was, it just wasn't a fit, you know, there was something about it that just didn't work. And, and so, so that went by the wayside. And then I tried, uh, uh, there was a, a, an, a friend of mine from college who, who got us involved with an inventor who he said he invented, and I think he did because it was pretty cool, virtual reality sound. So, and we'd hear these tapes and we put this, I put these headphones on my head and, and I'd listen to this dog like sniffing around my ear, but I felt the breath of the dog. Wow. It was the weirdest thing. Anyway. Yeah. It was the weirdest thing. So I was like, all right, I'll try. And, and so the, the idea was, we're going to um, we're going to record uh, like therapy type sessions for smoking cessation, stress management, and weight control through this technology because we feel like it would hit people at a deeper sort of autonomic level. I was like, cool, I'm in, whatever. And and we ended up working with a behavioral therapist out of Boston, um, and that's what got me to go out to Massachusetts, which, which, you know, I was supposed to be out there for three months and open some offices. And I didn't know anything about what I was doing. You know, I, I didn't have a clue. I was just like, all right, fine. I'm, I'm, you know, mid twenties, I'll try it. And so I, I learned a lot. It went okay. I made some sales. Um, there weren't enough sales to sustain the entire effort, you know, out there. So everybody decided to go back to, to, uh, uh, Michigan and 
And there were a few of us, like 10 of us. I mean, there were a bunch of guys and, and uh, they went back to Michigan. I decided to stay. So I stayed, I did some, uh, I did some carpentry work. I did some, I started working for this commercial window company doing takeoff. So I would, I would do all the, you know, the blueprint work to, to pull the necessary things off and, 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 you know, get them out to the marketplace, get quotes, and then we'd quote these window projects. And, and so, you know, I did that. And, and then I, at the gym, I met a guy who owned a commercial insurance brokerage and, and I got to be friendly with him. And I said, you know, can I have a job? I'll, I'll be a sales guy. I've done some of this stuff. And he's like, eh, I don't know. You seem a little rough around the edges. Cause I was, I was still rough around the edges and, uh, and I suppose I still am. So that hasn't changed a ton, <laughs> but, uh, but at, at one point we, we struck a deal. And, and so I started, I started that job as uh, on a draw. So it was, I was given $30,000 a year, but it was on a draw. So if I didn't make it back with sales, I owed the money back. And that was how I, that was how I began my real sales career. Um, and to make a very long story short, there's a lot more, uh, it's, it's most of it's in the book, but, um, I didn't, uh, you know, I, I spent about 20, 20 some years in that business. I became an owner, uh, in the company and the second largest shareholder and, you know, through just putting my nose down and doing the work. Um, and, uh, and it worked out extremely well for us. And so that's, that's kind of my career stuff that brings us to probably me being, you know, mid, uh, mid to late forties. Love it. So just taking opportunities as they came is what it sounds like. And then creating your own and not being so close-minded to say no when an opportunity came or, or sticking with it uh, when it got hard or difficult. I think a lot of times the upbringing, you talked about being working on a farm when you're in your younger uh, years and just that hard work, bailing hay in the summertime. Yeah. I've done all that too. Uh, yeah. You just, you learn what hard work really is and sticking to it. And so, yeah, good job on that. That's, that's super cool. So you. you've mentioned a few times about the book and, and about how your stories are inside of the book. I'd love to pivot into that if we possibly can. The name of, of when I'm, when I stop fighting, just Talk us about the book, where the title came from. Uh, who is it that we're fighting? Uh, just, yeah, let's just talk about the book. I think it'll be a lot of fun. I think at this point in the conversation. Sure. Yeah, this is, I don't know if you can see this well, but this is what it looks like. I know there's a little, it's orange. So it's uh, it's showing up orange. But but anyway, When I Stop Fighting is, is my first book. And it's, it was, uh, so probably 20 years ago, I was saying to my wife, uh, I was relating some story from my youth, you know, some some nutty thing. And and she met me, you know, many years after I got sober and, and recovered and that sort of thing. So she didn't see the nut job. And so I was telling her you know, a story uh, or some stories. And she's like, she's looking at me and she's like, you know what? You're not that guy anymore. And I'm, I said, no, I'm not that guy anymore. I'm absolutely not that guy anymore. And and I said, you know, to her way back then, 20 years ago, I said, remind me to write a book someday. And, and so over the next probably 18, 18 and a half years, um, she would say, hey, how's the book going? And, and over that time, I probably wrote three paragraphs. And, and so, so in conjunction with, with, you know, then COVID happened. And so we're, now we're up to, you know, 20, 21, 22. And, and, uh, and we did some life change stuff, you know, in terms of moving, we moved down to Georgia and, and we got rid of some, some assets, um, you know, liquidated some things. And, and I got down here and I was like, you know what, I think it's, I can write a book now and I'm, and I'm going to do it because I, because I want to give back. I want people to, I want people to read my story because not because my story is anything it is fairly entertaining you might get a kick out of it but <laughs> but because i want people to be able to relate to to 
things that I did and how I felt and, and, and things that I went through and understand that it's, it's okay to go through stuff. You have to go through stuff. Um, you have to go through hard things and it doesn't mean the end of the world. It, it means actually the opposite. When you allow yourself to go through hard things, it's opportunity. And and so I wanted to impart that. I, I didn't want to be one of those, you know, self-help things that says, you have to do this, you know, and if you don't do this, something bad's going to happen, you know, whatever. Um, so so it, it's it's not one of those kind of books. It's it's uh, it's my experiences. Um, and then the end of the book is just some of the things that I've learned and and, you know, that I think can be helpful to people is their as people are coming up and they're going through difficult things. Um, so that's, that's how the book got going. And, and I was, I was, um, it was in, let's see, it must've been 22 or 20. No, it was 23. Anyway, I'm bad with dates. I sat down to write the book. I had this book written within three months. Um, and then, uh, And I'm just, this is me being a nut job because that's how I, I do things. Um, I just, I, I, if I tackle it, I'm tackling it. And, and so I wrote this book and then I wrote the second book on the heels of the first one. And, you know, it's been about a year and a half now. Um, Well, actually it's been a year since my first book launched, uh, which was actually not even quite September 26th, I think of 2023. And now the other one is launching in October, um, October 15th. So, so, so once I put my head down, once I started to write, and and I think that's important for people to, to know, like, you can think about stuff forever. You can mull it over, you can analyze it, you can look at it a thousand different ways, but until we're willing to start doing and put our nose into it and, and just go. Um, not a lot happens. And, and the perfect evidence is, is me writing these two books. So that's kind of the question I've got that's coming to my mind is how do you, so when you're sitting in front of a big project like that, cause that's not something to just snap and it's over, even though you wrote it relatively a short period of time, but how do you process pushing yourself to the point of taking those first few steps? I think a lot of times folks will analysis paralysis or even just making decisions uh, very slowly versus taking action very quickly, right? And just figuring it out, figuring it out as you go. That's been how I try to approach things as well. But I'm just curious coming from you, how did you get yourself to finally sit down and just tackle the project? You know, there's there's a there's a a little passage in the 12 steps and and three words which I think are key and that's what it brings to mind for me Randy is is made a decision and I have to make a decision to start and I have to not, you know, there's, there's this whole thing of, you know, people say, well, don't take no for an answer. And people think that's about things outside them, but it's not, it's about things inside me. I can't take no for an answer from myself. If I know there's something to do, because if there's something that's in front of me to be done, it'll grate me until I do it. And it'll just sit in there and, 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 and it's friction and it's difficult. And I think about it and I'm like, Oh, I got to do that. And, and so, so that's the benefit of starting, you know, you don't have to spend that mind time. And, and, and I knew that from years of business and years of getting involved in things and years of taking risks and years of, of failing at things, you know, quote unquote, failing at things, which is, I don't judge it anymore. It's just experience. You know, it's just everything is a stepping stone. So, but I don't get a lot done in here. I get more done out here. And then this helps me, you know, this, this pushes me along and, and however, you know, I, I don't care what people believe, whether people believe in God or the universe or fate or whatever it is. But, but I do know this for sure that once I start, there's an entire army of something that helps me. Something that shows me the next step. Something that shows me where to go. Um, 
I think about this all the time, you know, learning lessons in this life is how is it that I can get the same lesson 18 times and if I don't learn it, I just keep getting it. I just keep getting the same lesson. It keeps coming across my desk, across my life, across, you know, my bandwidth. And how does that happen? Like, who knows? Who's in charge of that? And and so I ask myself those kind of questions because because I think it's important to understand that that you know leveling up and moving forward and continuing to do as opposed to just you know negotiate with myself. Oh, I don't really feel like it today. I'll do it tomorrow. You know, well maybe I'm you know maybe I got this other stuff to do. Um, and, and I'll say one more thing, Randy. I'm sorry. I know I'm going a little nuts here, but. But Zig Ziglar, was it Zig Ziglar? No, it was uh, Napoleon Hill, Think and Grow Rich, one of my favorite books of all time. And, uh, and he said, and I, and I think about this all the time, and I teach it to people as much as I can, but, but do what's necessary versus what you think is important. And there's mm-hmm. a big difference between what's necessary and what's important. And I try to keep that in mind you know, all this stuff goes through your whole life. Like I I don't, there's nothing that I've learned that I just throw away. You know, I, I have to keep doing what's necessary versus what's important as you know, and I'll keep doing that until they're, until they dispose of me. Love it. Yeah. So the idea of, so on the podcast with rich mind podcast, I talk about winning within. And so you mentioned even with the title of your book and the title of your podcast, you're the fight. And I, that's where I think that that's where the fight comes from. Is it within that internal dialogue, that internal battle that's going on inside of you that's controlling basically your outside environment because you either are or you're not doing the things that you're fighting with in your own mind. Is that close? Is that kind of what I'm hearing you say, even with the titles of your books and, and that type of thing? 100%, Randy. Yeah, absolutely. That That is what it is. It's it's um. There's very few there's very few things that we see in our day-to-day life where people are teaching us that we, if we improve ourselves and we work on this, our entire life improves. And, and cause everybody's looking outside to say, Oh, if I only had more money or if I, you know, got more likes on social media or if my selfies looked better or, you know, blah, 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 whatever it is, everybody's reaching outside to say, you know, what can I do to improve my life out here? And, and that's the way our world is. I don't blame people for that because that's the way our world is designed and, and that's how it works. But that's how the world works. That's not how we work. I've said to my sons since they were this big, I said, if, and, and nothing wrong with what anybody else does. And I, and I don't, you know, how, however people run their lives is how they run their lives. And, and that's completely cool. But I said to my sons, like, if you do something different than what probably 95% of the people do, you're going to have a great life. If you do the same things that everybody does, you might struggle. You know, you might, you might have a tough time. And if you just fall into that, you know, doing the same thing. So, so you have to take risks, you have to get out there, you have to, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And that's where, you know, we fight with ourselves, right? We, we fight with ourselves to, to start and we fight with ourselves to persevere and we fight with ourselves, whether or not we have enough courage and, and, and. I'll say something about courage. You know, people talk about, oh, I just, if I just had the courage to do that, I would do it. And my answer is, you have the courage. You just have to go do it. You know, there's no, there's courage isn't going to enter you because you think about it. You know, the courage comes as we do, and the courage comes as we, as we take that risk. And, and that's what I've found in my life. Now, I can, you know, the fights for me have gone from, from fighting drugs and alcohol, fighting, you know, that grating within myself of lying, cheating, stealing, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I I talked about the launch pad a little earlier and, you know, my launch pad was full of just garbage, you know, just stuff, all the, 
all the things that I was doing that were not in the flow of, of what my life could be. And so I had to jettison a bunch of stuff. I had to jettison a bunch of things, belief systems and old friends. And, you know, you just work through that stuff as you go, but, but it's a battle, you know, it is a battle. And then, you know, and then the path gets narrower and the razor, you know, till you're on a razor blade and, and life and life becomes the fights become much more subtle. You know, the fights become these little things in me like, like, oh man, I, you know, do I really have time to meditate this morning? Do I really have time for my breath work? Do I really have time for my exercise stuff? And, you know, oh, I got to hurry up and, you know, get to this meeting or this, you know, whatever this podcast, whatever it is. And, and, and those are the things now that I, that I think about in terms of the fights and, and, you know, I have to settle myself down and settle into my disciplines, you know, and, and settle into how I start my day every single day. And, and that's what I do. So, so the fights can go from the real big stuff to the real subtle stuff. And, and, you know, they, it still, it happens. It's going to happen again. Like everything I've talked about, it's going to happen till the end of of my time here on the planet. And then I don't know what's going to happen after that. It might be, might be more of the same. We'll see. Never seems like it ever stops. I talk about triggers on the podcast a lot for myself. Like I'll get triggered by an event, triggered by something somebody says that just sparks off a thought process in my mind. That's usually not necessarily a good thing. Right. But then it takes me down rabbit trails that I've worked really hard on trying to get control of those thoughts, becoming more present, gratitude, being grateful, just all of the normal things that I say normal, meaning they've become normal for me because that's, those are the types of things I'm trying to be intentional about. Just curious, when you start the fight, when the fight begins to rage in your mind, you mentioned about meditation and some exercise and that type of thing. I'm just curious if there's some intentional things that you do, whether it's on a daily basis or when you feel like you might be starting to go down some negative fights in your own mind that uh, what might be helpful for folks that are out there listening to us today going, yeah, exactly. I I'm dealing with the exact same thing, but I'm just not exactly sure where to begin. Are there some things that, that you do that you've discovered that have really helped you in the process? There are, there are absolutely. Um, and, and crucial things, you know, consistency and discipline are, are two sort of centuries on our path of, of getting better, you know, on a, on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. And, and I don't, I, I say that sort of tongue in cheek because a lot of people put pressure on themselves. Oh, I got to be 1% better every day. No, you just need to continue moving forward. That's all you need to do. And so that's my belief. But, but, uh, you know, I learned over time and I've had, you know, other wonderful mentors. I have a wonderful mentor named Amit who, uh, who taught me, and this was probably 25 years ago now, but he, cause I've always kind of wanted to do meditation and I always wanted to just see if I can quiet this madness, you know, between my ears. And, uh, and, and so I tried different things. I read Thich Nhat Hanh. I read, uh, John Kabat-Zinn. I read, you know, even Marianne Williamson had an old book about some meditation stuff, I think back in the day. So, so all of those things, um, you know, I tried and, and it just didn't seem to resonate, but, but uh, Amit taught me a way of meditation and he met with me and, you know, I, I, I looked him up. I actually found him on, on the internet and uh, um, he taught me this, this meditation. It's called primordial sound meditation and it uses a mantra and it's just, it's just, uh, you know, 15, 20 minutes every morning of, of, of saying this mantra and allowing whatever happens to just come and go, let it, let things come, let things go. And, and, and it's a cool thing and it's not, you know, it's not crazy. It's not like this woo woo nutty stuff. It's just, it's just allowing myself to be quiet. And, and the same time I'm allowing my mind to be quiet, I'm also allowing my body to be quiet because I'm, I'm sitting and, and so that's a very cool thing. The other thing that I do is, is I do breath work. Um, and Amit and I have become very good friends and, and, you know, we, we hang out and uh, we see each other as often as we can. It's usually once or twice a year. And, uh, and he started a place that does breath work and, and he's a doctor in Boston. And, and, uh, so he does this breath work and he taught me the breath work. And that's another thing that I do on a daily basis. And then, 
And the last thing I do is, is I practice gratitude and I, and I think of the things that I'm grateful for in the morning before I get going with my day. And I, so the breath work, the meditation and the gratitude are probably 45 minutes to an hour of my morning. Um, and this morning I was out and it was dark outside and, you know, I'm doing that stuff and I get up and I'm okay, let's go, you know, and, but it puts me in a situation where I'm like this, like this is, this is, and I got some hairy stuff going on right now and it doesn't matter. You know, I'm, it's completely cool. Um, because, cause it's not about what's going on about he, out here. It's about what's going on in here. And one last thing I'll say, Randy, about this is, is whatever we do, and this is important for, for young people to get or any, but any age really, I think. And, and it, it took me a while to learn it is whatever we do, continues to reverberate it continues to reverberate in our lives and it's it's like a it's like a wood stove you know it just it just it moves out from from that source and and so when i do the things that i practice every day it reverberates into my day and reverberates into my life and reverberates into my business interactions my personal interactions you know, with my wife, with my boys, with my dogs, uh, with strangers, with everything. And, and, and so what we do and what we practice is it's crucial to pay attention to those things. And if, if there are, are practices we can adopt and develop, and, you know, you can start with, with 30 seconds of sitting in a chair and saying, you know, and just quieting your mind and allowing thoughts to go through and, you know, it doesn't have to be, it took me a long time. It took me a long time to be comfortable because my mind was zipping, you know, like constantly. So start small and, and build, you know, build over time. Love it. So just you almost for myself, like, what did you call that meditation again? I don't think I've ever heard of that as far as the, what it was called itself. It's called primordial sound meditation. Primordial sound. I'm gonna have to look that up when we get off. It's something I, I do guided meditations, earbuds, and that, you know, just once again, just trying to get calm, quiet, control the thoughts. I mean, so I'm always trying to experiment, try different things myself. So I appreciate you sharing those resources that I see. Yes, folks. Yeah. That uh, mic drop moment right there. That was good stuff. Uh, rewind that. Listen to that little section right there. If you can comprehend those types of things and, and it's being intentional, setting yourself up, setting your day up with intention that you can accomplish so many great things moving forward, even if it is difficult things going on in your exterior world. So as we start to bring this one in for a close, Daryl, once off, first off, let me thank you so much. This has been so much fun. I knew this was going to be a great conversation. Of course. I love it. Is there just one last nugget of wisdom? I know you shared a ton of stories so far. You obviously have your book, uh, which I'm going to definitely encourage everybody to go out there and grab a copy. Uh, the new copy or the new book is going to be coming out in October, as he mentioned, and I'll have the links to the to that book as well, depending on when this uh, goes live. You can definitely grab a copy of that as well. But is there one last nugget of wisdom, a story, anything like that, that resonates with what we, we've either discussed today or just something that's going on in your exterior world that you think that uh, somebody might be find some, some value in today? Sure. Uh, yeah, there's a, there's a, there's a story and it's, it's, from my book. Um, and it's near and dear to me. It's near and dear to my heart. Uh, it's something that, that is, um, crucial for me. And again, it's one of those things I probably heard when I was 19 or 20 years old and it stayed with me my entire existence. And it, and the cool thing about this sort of stuff is, is it stays with you, but it changes and it becomes, you know, relevant at different times and, and, shows up in different ways and and that's how these lessons in life unfold and it's the coolest thing to watch as we as we continue to move you know through life and um so so i was probably you know a year or less sober or something like that maybe you know maybe up to a year and a half and 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 we would go to this this meeting on friday nights and it was called the community center meeting and it was it was a 12 step meeting and and it was just something that i had to do to to keep my head together and and sort of put my life on a path and and this community center meeting was was a big one it was probably i don't know 150 200 people uh at any time in this meeting and so you know myself and a bunch of my friends you know some were clowns some weren't 
some were serious about sobriety, some weren't, you know, that's just part of it. I was probably a clown. Um, but I was serious about sobriety and I wanted to recover and I wanted to be better. And, and, and there was this gentleman there and his name was Jimmy and he was, he was a little hunched over and he was an older guy. He was, you know, had to be in his seventies and he walked pretty slow and, and, uh, you know, one of those people that you may not really pay attention to necessarily. And, but he was at that time about 40 years sober. And to, to me and to some of the other guys, he was kind of like a deity, you know, he's like, it's like, wow, Jimmy, you know, and, and, uh, but he was the only guy in that meeting that would grab the coffee pot and he would go around the meeting and he would fill people's coffee. He would refill people's coffee and, and that selflessness and that, that service and that, uh, you know, ability to be humble. And he's not thinking, Oh, I'm, you know, I'm this guy who's got all this sobriety. And, you know, he was just, he was, he was just the coolest human being. And, and so that's one part of the story, but the second part of the story is, and it fits him uh, to a T. He used to say in the meetings, and, and and this was, I don't remember anything else he said. And that's the really cool thing about life. You know, maybe there's these five or 10 things where you just remember that little piece. And And he used to say, if you want to move forward in this life and you want to get rid of you know, some of the garbage around you and, and, you know, move in a direction that makes sense, you have to stay small. And, and he always used to say that stay small. And it took that a while, you know, like, 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 you know, when I stopped fighting kind of thing that Bud told me, you know, it takes a while to integrate, it takes a while for me to understand. And, and what he was saying is, is, if I move into life with, with a degree of humility and I understand that I don't know it all and I'm open to learning and I'm open to being teachable, you know, with, with things like this, like you and I have had experiences that, that we can share our experiences and help people and help younger people maybe get through some things or at least have hope that they can get through things. And, and so that's all, you know, being, being, staying small is, is being teachable and being willing to listen and willing to, um, you know, to follow wisdom, follow, uh, experience and, and people who care and people who are looking out for you, um, you know, not just looking out for themselves. So there was a whole lot in there, but that's, that's a story that I love and, and a story that's near and dear to me forever. Love it. Love it. Appreciate you sharing that story. Yeah. Humility, being humble, showing up for service or as, as a service, right? To others is so crucial to succeed in any form of life, whether it's your own family, for yourself, for your community. That's, that's huge. So thank you so much for sharing that story. So folks are out there, I'm sure it's like, okay, you guys have talked about this book, these, all these stories, right? All this wisdom. What are the best places for people, number one, to get the book? and connect with you? Like, are you on social media? Like, where are the best places for people to get in contact with you, Daryl? I am on social media. I'm not that great at it. (laughs) (laughs) We were talking about that before we hit record. I I would consider myself not great at it either, but yes, I'm sorry. Please continue. (laughs) No, that's fine. I'm I'm getting better at it. So, so I have a website and uh, it's DarylDittmer.com, D-A-R-Y-L-D-I-T-T-M-E-R.com. Um, that has, has links to everything. It has, uh, links to the book on Amazon. You can find my book on Amazon and, and you can either Google my name, Daryl Dittmer or Google when I stop fighting and, uh, or not. Yeah. And it'll show you, it'll take you to Amazon, take you to the book or go to Amazon and just put in when I stop fighting or Daryl Dittmer and it'll take you right there. Um, I'm on, uh, Twitter and it's at Daryl E. Dittmer. So it's D-A-R-Y-L-E Dittmer, D-I-T-T-M-E-R. And uh, I'm also on Instagram under When I Stop Fighting, Facebook under When I Stop Fighting. Um, those are really probably the, the major ones. And, and my second book will be coming out. Um, if you, if you want to sign up for an excerpt of the second book, 
Uh, you can sign up on the website. There'll be a pop-up as soon as you go on. Just give me your email address and we'll make sure that you get uh, the first chapter of the second book. So um, I thought that was pretty cool that uh, somebody a lot smarter than me came up with. That was a good idea. <laughs> Finding people to put on the team to help you do the things you're not necessarily good at. That's uh, that's always a fun process for sure. Uh, you're also a podcaster as well by the same title, correct? As far as if people want to be even just get learn a little bit more about you with your stories and even the guests that you might be bringing on your show. Yeah. Thank you for reminding me, Randy. See, I'm not good at this part of it. Um, my podcast is called When I Stop Fighting the Podcast. And uh, and it's it's uh, on YouTube, Spotify, Amazon, uh, Apple Podcasts, um, you know, whatever, all the sort of podcast things. Um, it's up there. And, and, you know, I talk with people about life. I talk with people about some of the things that they fight and some of the ways that maybe we can, you know, help alleviate those fights and help ourselves to get away from fighting all the time, that sort of thing. And, and uh, have had some really cool guests, you know, some, some psychologists and professors and, you know, just regular dudes like me and, and wonderful, you know, authors and that sort of thing. So, um, pretty cool. Uh, I've gotten some, some feedback on it that makes me feel good because I feel like people are getting, you know, they're getting some ideas and, and getting some help. So, so it's that's great, how we're, that's how we're getting out there. It's a great resource I, in preparation of this episode today, folks, I was binging on a lot of his episodes, trying to get a little bit more information about Daryl and yes, great content. Uh, I highly, re you. highly recommend go out there and follow him on any of the podcast platforms. And it sounds like YouTube as well. Uh, that would be well worth your time. So Daryl, once again, just want to thank you for taking your time today to join us here on the Rich Mind Podcast and share so much wisdom with everybody. I, I just know it's going to resonate with so many people. So thanks so much. Thank you, Randy. I, I really appreciate it. It was a lot of fun. And, uh, and, and I'm, I'm always hoping we did some good. And I, I think we did today. So thank you. Thank you Abs for facilitating absolutely. that. Absolutely. Appreciate it so much. So folks, hopefully you found some uh, value in the message today. Uh, Daryl's stories, I knew that they would resonate. At least they definitely resonated with me, right? Coming from our Midwestern background, uh, just the way we were brought up to believe certain things. And then obviously you, you're kind of bombarded with different things as you're getting older, the pivots, the changes, all the stuff that goes on in our in our reality. And then when we come to the conclusion that it's from within, I talk about winning within. Daryl talks about winning the fight, fighting from within yourself, right? It's very similar, just in different, uh, different terms that when you get and realize that that is, I don't want to say it's the secret, but at the same time, it's, it's a very big piece of becoming successful, whether it's in your personal life, your family life, in your professional life, you've got to work on that internal battle, that internal fight, winning within. And when you do that, your life can completely be changed. And that's how it's been for me. It sounds like that's how it's been for Daryl as well. So go out there, have a fantastic day. If you wouldn't mind sharing this message with as many people as you possibly can, uh, you can find me on all the podcast platforms as well as on uh, different social medias. I'll have all the links in the show notes, but get, connect with, get, get connected with Daryl, uh, grab a copy of his book. I'll make sure we have all those links in there as well. So as I mentioned, have a fantastic day. I look forward to coming back with the next guest again very soon. Until then, bye now.